Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned! Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week, suck it, Iron Fist! We're talking about Shang-Chi! Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for place to hang your cape. My name's Scott James Merriju, and this is a show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. Today's guest is an AP2HYC writer extraordinaire. It's Dylan Fine. How you doing, Dylan? I'm great. That was a, that was a great introduction. I'm not sure if I can follow that up. And I'm glad that you put in that we are going to be having spoilers in this review, because oh, now sure. I feel like I have a lot more freedom. Oh god, yes. We all I love doing these Marvel movies, but we always put a spoiler warning in because I don't want to spoil anything for anyone. This is why I avoid all the trailers for Marvel movies. Like every time I've been going to the cinema a bit more recently now, they started to open things up, although I might stop doing that the way things are in Scotland right now. But uh I've been constantly like just quickly putting my earbuds in, shutting my eyes, and playing something loud on my iPhone uh when the Eternals trailer comes up or something like that. Just because, like, I, I don't want to see anything. I don't want to be spoiled because I know I'm going to see these movies, so I don't need to see the trailer. And, I mean, the it seems like a lot of people haven't actually seen this movie yet. I saw this, like, a week or so ago. Uh, we've been a little bit late getting it out due to things like the uh, 200th episode. We had a break after that. But not a lot of people have seen this film. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I think it's, as you kind of said before, a lot of people are uncomfortable going back to the movie theaters. Is it available on um, any streaming devices right now, like HBO or whatnot? As far as I'm aware, no. It would be on Disney+, Plus, I would assume, but it's not, which I'm glad about, because if they did that, there'll be Premier Access, which I fucking hate. It's a fucking capitalist nightmare, which makes me want to hate Disney even more. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad for that. But at the same time, uh, despite the fact that it appears... Not a lot of people have seen it. I'll be honest with you, Dylan. I asked several people before inviting you on the show. None of them were available. None of them could do it. So as much as I'm glad that you're here, I was getting a bit desperate. However, that does not appear to have impacted Shang-Chi's uh, box office returns. It's doing quite well. Yeah, and also I, Shang-Chi's a very unknown character, and he hasn't been, you know... Unless you're me. Yes, exactly. He's a, a, amongst the mainstream to a certain extent, a relatively unknown character. It's Phase 4, and maybe because Endgame was, you know, this huge film that, you know, closed a lot of, you know, character arcs and whatnot. Uh, and we've now had... we get the B-listers in. That's why we're getting Moon Knight. That's why we're getting yeah. Shang-Chi. I mean, um, I think, I honestly think, if they hadn't ballsed it up with two seasons of Iron Fist, we may have gotten that character instead. But you know what? I'm glad we got this character because um, he's been around Marvel for quite some time since the 1970s because Wuja films, martial arts films were all the rage back then and Marvel was not above riding popular trends. That's why we had, they had Luke Cage as a sort of like a black exploitation character. And that's why they got Iron Fist in as a martial artist. But, they also, but here's the thing. Iron Fist was a martial artist, but he was never like Marvel's go-to martial artist. That was always Shang-Chi. Uh, to the point where they even made his dad, and this is not a spoiler for the movie, but this is an inter interesting bit of Marvel trivia, Fu Manchu. As in the horrendously racist Asian character stereotype from various media, who is in the public domain, so I guess they could do that. Hmm. I'm glad they changed that for this movie. Good thing they did not include that name in the film at all. Yeah, it, they just completely sidestep that, and I'm glad about that. That's what's great about slightly smaller characters, like less well-known characters like Shang-Chi, is that you can make those alterations and no one would really care. I mean, I doubt there's a horde of people out there screaming, no, make his dad the racist stereotype again! Although, considering our current climate, maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we're going to get in talking all about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings therein, but before we do that... We've got to do the news! Lord 
of news <laughs> right now in the webosphere, but before we can really talk about any of that, honestly, all the news we've got today is trailer news. We've got a whole bunch of trailers we want to talk about. First and foremost, uh, red pill or blue pill, Dylan? <laughs> Let's do the red pill. Let's get right to it. Uh, the Matrix 4. They're bringing it back. Honestly, as much as I respect the first Matrix film, and to a slightly lesser extent, the second Matrix film, uh, honestly, I think the best movie in the whole thing is like the Animatrix, where it's just like an anthology film utilizing different animation styles. Because uh, that was what expanded the lore and had all sorts of cool characters and history and interesting ideas and really explored the nature of what the matrix could be and the movies didn't really fall into that category for me i thought like the first movie was great at setting things up and having like the whole gun carter thing and then afterwards it's just like wow i actually don't care about any of these characters because the only one that even emotes slightly and even though it's like every few scenes is fucking mr smith and he's meant to be an emotionless robot what the fuck and now they're bringing it back because everyone fucking loves Keanu Reeves right now, which I get. And the trailer looks kind of cool. It'll be interesting to see what they do. But, I mean, it's the Wachowskis. Let's be honest. Hit and miss is sort of their bread and butter. Yeah, I'm saying with Ben Mike Shyamalan. And, you know, this most <laughs> recent movie by Shyamalan was somewhat of a miss. But, you know, maybe... What if old? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was, um, some of the dialogue in that movie was not great for someone who in Lady in the Water made himself the greatest writer of all time. In that <laughs> who then, in the future, would martyr himself for the cause, thus bringing about world peace because he's dead, but his books were so fucking awesome. Or, not his book, his writing was so fucking awesome. And who's the big, bad, evil villain of that movie, aside from the made-up monsters? <gasps> The film critic! Boo! Boo! We see fucking through. I mean, side tangent, here's the thing with M. Night Shyamalan. He is a very good filmmaker. But the problem was, everyone told him to his face that he was a very good filmmaker. They said he was a genius. They said he was the next Steven Spielberg. And he fucking believed them. And in his mind, I think subconsciously, he meant that he thought that that meant that he didn't have to try as hard. And because he didn't try as hard, we got the village, lazy water, fucking Avatar, and all that shit. Oh, don't get me started on the Avatar. Don't, don't get me started on that. But I think at some point he wised up and has started churning out some pretty good films now. Let's hope this is just a momentary blip before we delve back into pretentiousness. Because even if you do have a good idea, it's not always going to work. But... That's just him. And it's the same with the Wachowskis. Like, they made, like, a couple of good films. I actually think that, while it's not a fantastic adaptation, their version of V for Vendetta, I thought was pretty goddamn good. Yeah. It was it was pretty grounded. It wasn't weird in too many ways. But I liked it. It's not as good as the graphic novel, but it's still good. But then they do things like Jupiter Ascending. Why, why did you make fucking Magic Mike an alien dog person? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Didn't that but film anyway. come out in like January? You know, the month where usually mm. all the bad films come out. And I remember watching the trailer and thinking, I feel like this movie, they've had it in the books for like not like five years. And they're just finding an irrelevant month to put it on just because they know it's a piece of trash. Now, the problem is, I think the biggest problem with them is that both of them, I know one's called Lana, I can't remember what the other one's called, they're both fangirls. They just, they love, the reason why they made The Matrix was because they wanted to do a Ghost in the Shell movie. That was it. And that's fine, but it can, me it can mean you get too into your own niche subjects, and that's not always great. I mean, I'm not one for saying you should always go for mass appeal, but there's a healthy middle ground, I think. But anyway, enough about that. Major trailer, everyone's already seen it. There was a big run-up. There was trailers for the trailer, and that's the world we live in now. Far more interesting trailers. Recent trailer for the new Hawkeye series, which I haven't seen. Me neither. I have not seen it at all. And I guess I'm excited. You know, they did a movie for Black Widow, so might as well do a series for Hawkeye, I guess. He's a very compelling character. They did a very good job humanizing him in Age of Ultron. So let's yeah. see how the character, how they expand on it going forward. And in Endgame. I like this character arc in Endgame. I, I'm, just, I'm just excited to see Jeremy Renner back as Hawkeye, but also well, what's-her-face, Age of 17, uh, Dickinson. Can't remember her name. Hayley Steinfeld. Hayley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop. I think she's a fantastic actor. 
uh, really liked her in Bumblebee. And I think uh, very interesting to see her as the protege of Hawkeye. I think that'll be really, really cool. But like I said, I am definitely going to see it and we will one day review that show on this site. But uh, we haven't, not going to see it because spoilers, capers, if you want to go and see that trailer, go nuts. Another trailer I want to talk about. I never saw this coming in a million years. Bright Samurai Soul. Remember Bright? No, <laughs> to be honest, I don't. Okay, let me put it this way. Fairy lives don't matter today. Okay. Will Smith. Oh, I okay, I've heard of it. I I've heard of it. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen any of their con- any content of it, but I've heard of it. Honestly, you're not missing much. I thought it was an all right film with several like big problems. A lot of people didn't like it. It was like a fantasy world, but it's like our world, and there's like orcs and fairies and magic and all this sort of shit. And now, for some reason, they're doing an animated movie featuring a uh, Simu Lu. Lee, uh, how do you pronounce his fucking name? One second. Simu Lu. Simu. Yes. I do. I will be mispronouncing a ton of names today. I do apologize. Um. I probably already mispronounced Shang-Chi a bunch. Uh, but he's in it, and it's like a prequel to that movie, the uh, live-action movie, set in Japan, with like a human and orc teaming up together to save an elf, which is the exact same fucking premise of the other movie. But the animation looks fucking kick-ass. So maybe it'll be worth a shot. Who knows? Uh, that's uh, a bunch of... Well, that's one animated trailer and two live-action trailers. Now we've got a bunch of video game trailers. Two Marvel, one Star Wars. Start with the Star Wars film first. They're remaking Knights of the Old Republic. (laughs) I'm excited. Have you ever played Knights of the Old Republic? I honestly don't even play that many video games, to be honest with you. Shame on you, sir! Most of the video games I play are, are FIFA, and you don't want to see what happens when I lose in FIFA or in NBA 2K. It's not a pretty sight. I, in my college dorm room, I've gotten some complaints from neighbors. I get oh, a little gee. competitive. Well, I mean, I, doing this show, honestly, I'd say I can understand where you're coming from. But yeah, so Knights of the Republic is possibly one of the best Star Wars games ever made. Possibly even one of the best role-playing video games ever ever made it is required playing for any moderately serious gamer there was two games knights of the republic and knights of the republic the sith lords the second one of which was a bit uh rushed and a bit unfinished but was still pretty fun to play and it's set four thousand years before the skywalker saga in the old old republic and it's all about the battle between Jedi and Sith, and it's fucking awesome, and there's killer robots and cool aliens, and you go to Tatooine, and you're on the ship called the Ebon Hawk, and it's, uh, it's, you can be a Jedi, it's so much fun, and it's so great, and it's, it was released in 2003, and it still holds up today. Graphics are a bit outdated, but you know what? It doesn't detract from the enjoyment of the game. It's fucking amazing. You choose to be in the light side or the dark side. You form friendships with all these cool characters which have unique backstories and motivations. It is made by Bioware, the makers of Mass Effect, so you know it's good. And it's just so much fun to play and they are remaking it. Not remastering it, remaking it. Bioware, PlayStation, Asper, who have been um, like porting a whole bunch of games like PS4 from Star Wars. Uh, they are just bring all this absurd amount of talent to making a game from the ground up not just a remaster a remake and it's fucking awesome we've only got a small teaser for it and i hope they haven't started production on it now because it means we're gonna have to wait a long time and i don't want them to pull a cyberpunk 2077 and for us to just wait and constantly get hyped and hyped and hyped and hyped and hyped and hyped and hyped hyped but I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. In the meantime, Dylan, your homework for this evening. Fucking play that game. It's on Steam. Download it. Fine. Any- is Mark Hamill, he's in the game as one of the voice actors, right? He's in the game. Mark Hamill? No, he oh is not. Gosh. But you Jennifer Hale is. Ever. And you don't put him in the game as one of the main characters? 
I, I guess not. Sorry, he does other things outside of Star Wars. Come on. But like, yeah. like Jennifer Hale's in it. Raphael Sabage is in it. There's a whole bunch of fantastic voices. I think Tom Kenny's in it. There's a, there's a whole bunch oh. of fantastic voice actors. So okay. uh, check it out at least. I'll watch some like clips or trailers or Let's Plays if you're really not unsure. But it's so, so cool. Uh, moving on to Marvel news. And it, they're busy over it in Insomniac because not only are we getting the trailer for Spider-Man 2, the second Marvel's PS4, now PS5 Spider-Man. Uh, a side note, Capers, excellent news. I just finally fucking got a PS5. I've been waiting for fucking ages and I finally got it. I got it like a couple of weeks ago and... I already finished Spider-Man Miles Morales. It's a fucking awesome game. Highly recommend you play it if you can, if you can't. Sucks to be you. But I'm really looking forward to Spider-Man 2 because, we'll spoil a hint for that trailer, Venom's gonna be in it. <laughs> exciting, 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 exciting. But possibly even more exciting, or at least just as exciting, Insomniac have also announced they're going to be taking a look at another Marvel character. Only fucking Wolverine! Oh! Wolverine, they got a whole CGI te teaser for the Wolverine game, and I'm excited because the last Wolverine game I played, where he wasn't a character with other Marvel characters, was the tie-in game for Wolverine Origins. Now, uh -oh. that movie was shit yes but the game was pretty good you could be like wolverine and you could dash around clawing people to bits it had like it was actually kind of gory it had a proper dismemberment and blood and then whenever wolverine gets shot he heals so you see like the bullet wounds slowly start to shrink if you were gonna if something explodes in your face like your whole face melts away and then grows back it's really fucking great and you start off with like a vest like a tank top and then that gets shredded and you just grow back bare-chested. It was really, really cool. And it got boring really fucking quickly. Was uh, Wolverine Origins, was that the film where uh, Deadpool was in it? And they gave Deadpool no. some sword hands. No. Made him a mute. And no. He was even invincible. Deadpool wasn't in that movie. Okay, okay. Deadpool okay. was not in that movie. You shut your mouth. It's yeah, uh, uh, he was in that fucking game as well. I mean, it was a pretty cool game. It's just that after like 10 levels of soaring bad guys in half of your claws, you get cut. It was very repetitive, is what I'm saying. Um, so I'm interested to see what Insomniac are going to do with these games. There's a whole bunch of characters. You know, like, speaking of Iron Fist, I really want a Heroes for Hire game from Insomniac where it's like Luke Cage and Iron Fist. You play as both characters. You can maybe swap between them at certain levels. You play as one character and you alternate, whatever. And it's just them trying to be like superhero, fighting for good mercenaries. I want that. I think that'll be fun. Anyway, uh, the Wolverine trailer looks fucking good. It is a CGI trailer, which about tells you as much about what's going to be in the game as, say, a cucumber tells you about the Dead Sea Scrolls, i.e. nothing, but... It It'll be it'll be interesting to see whether that game turns out. But it's Insomniac, so I know. Did you play the Spider Man game from Insomniac? No, I. I, I once again, I'm. Dylan, <laughs> you're disappointed in me. I know, I know. But I have to watch my crappy B, you know, uh, B horror movies on TV yeah. casually all the time instead of playing video games. I just have only so much time in my day, and. Fix I'm your sorry. priorities, man. I had, to, I had to watch Lady in the Water last night. I had to do it. It was on TV. I had to remember how bad it was. and it No one has to do that. I also saw a Gaspar uh, Now film. Uh, no film. Climax. That movie was crazy. I saw it at like 1 a.m. It gave me nightmares. Um, so, Have you seen that new film, Malignant? No, I need to because I'm doing, shameless plug, I'm doing a review of that. In about a month. And I need to see it because I like James Wan. I think most people like James Wan. And I heard yeah. it batshit crazy. So, you know. I've I heard interesting he things. I'm not a horror guy, so I'm not going to watch it. But I do like James Wan. I do respect the guy. I think Was he the guy who made Upgrade? He, no, that was Lee Winnell. That was his friend. Lee yeah. Winnell. He made Aquaman. And yes. he made, um, I'm trying to think of other uh, 
action films that he did. I don't know. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. I know. Was, all four I, 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 no, I was about to say he did like uh, Star Trek Beyond, didn't he? But he didn't. That was someone else. I think that was someone else. Yeah. I know he did Aquaman. I know he did, uh, you know, Saw, The Conjuring, Insidious, which yeah. spurred three franchises, three of the most, probably the three most popular horror franchises right now. Um, yeah. He did one more film. I swear. No, he did The Invisible Man. No, that was Lee Winnell. That movie. And Lee Winnell again. Yeah. We, no, they're no, they're friends. They went to film school together, and and they did Saw together, didn't they? Yes, yes, yes. Lee Winnell was even one of the main characters in the movie. The guy went no, game yeah. over. Na 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 na. Lee Winnell is one of the best young directors out there. Not one of the best actors out there. No. I think even he did <laughs> that. I mean, that was back when, you know, they had like a budget of like three ham sandwiches and a big bottle of Sprite for like the whole movie. So I don't I don't begrudge him turning up in the very first movie. It's not like he inserted himself into all the other movies afterwards. So No, and he's a phenomenal director. I mean, I can't watch those movies. I've only watched like reviews of them with the clips like heavily edited just because I'm interested in like the progression of one of the most influential horror series of all time. I like horror as a genre from a very, very far distance. Okay, so I, I like you, but I don't want to be in the same room as you, is what I'm saying. Anyway, and that is the news we talked about for that far too long. But before we can actually talk about Shang-Chi and Legend of the Ten Rings, here are some ads. Check them out. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. This movie's awesome. Oh, Shang Chi! Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're doing no, no fucking right Jungle now. Cruise. Of course, Shang Chi. I haven't seen Jungle Cruise. I, I <laughs> but I, not I missing much. Okay, so it's fine. It's fine. There's like one scene that's really cool because it features like a cover of a Metallica song, but that's about it. Uh, anyway, so I was really, really interested to see what a Marvel martial arts movie was look would look like. God knows we didn't get that with Iron Fist. I'm not going to talk about that show the whole time, but I've recently just found out that um, fucking Finn, what's his name, who played Iron Fist in that show, didn't even turn up for like most of his martial arts training. Like, fuck you, dude. Come on, that's your one job. Uh, Simu Lu is much better as shang chi uh, and it is pronounced shang chi i'm probably even mispronouncing that but i've been calling him shang chi for way too long same. i do apologize same and i apologize i at certain points said shanghai so you know Shang- i'm getting better shang chi <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> don't even know how you do that. But yeah, this is, I mean, the only really, I hadn't, I knew about Shang Chi, Shang Chi, but the only thing I'd ever really seen him in was a, um, a sort of a team up issue of Ultimate Spider Man, where Spider Man, he team up for a little bit, and at the end, he teaches Spider Man a couple of kung fu moves and then legs it. And that was all I knew about the character. I know he's, been in tons of things since then, but wasn't familiar. So there was no real way for this movie to disappoint me unless, you know, it brings on the writers of Black Widow. So you don't love Black Widow either. That's interesting. I wrote it's, a review. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I did a whole review of it. It's fine. There's some good bits to it. It's just really disappointing. I mean, I, I <laughs> let me put it this way. I still think that Captain Marvel is a good movie. So my bar for bad Marvel movies is still pretty high. Well, she's such a good character. She's almost the heart of, in the Avengers, she's the main character to a certain extent until the last few scenes. And it didn't feel like they really paid her character that much respect in the film. It seemed like it was about her co-stars you know, character arc going forward. She seemed like a passenger in her own feature movie. And also they they put it together in 2021 of a story that happened after Civil War. It seems like they were just like, well, you know, we'll do a Black Widow film. Why not? It's going to make some money and whatnot. So a character that I really liked that sacrificed herself, you know, in Endgame, 
I don't really think for a last hurrah, and from what I heard, this is very much a last hurrah in the MCU for Scarlett Johansson. I don't mm. feel like a film like that really gave the character that much, the respect that it deserved, especially now as... this is a kick in the knickers. That's what the whole yes. movie was. Yeah, uh, we're not going to talk about that movie all the time. What yeah. I loved about this movie, though, was it kind of felt like... Not a return to form, because that implies the previous movies were bad, but uh, it felt very much like a Phase 1 Marvel movie, or at very least a Phase 2, because it, it was just focusing on an origin story of that character seemingly rather disconnected from a lot of the other Marvel movies. Although, obviously, some characters do return, we'll get into that. And... I really liked that because we had so many, you know, big crossovers and events and uh, returning characters. It's nice to just sort of like, okay, let's try blank slate, a little bit of a refresher, and we're going to also build on this as well. It felt really, really refreshing. Although I will say it does start thousands of years ago. Let's get right into the plot. So we start with this guy, (sighs) Zhu Wenwu. Am I pronouncing that correctly? I don't know. I call him Wen Wu, or the Mandarin. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Okay, so this is something that's been building since Iron Man 3, because after Iron Man 3, there was a short film called Hail to the King, where we see Trevor Slattery in prison, talking about like, oh yeah, hi, I was the Mandarin, but not really, only to be captured by someone claimed to be from the Ten Rings organization. You know those guys from Iron Man 1? (gasps) What's going to happen? We'll find out. Well, it turns out the Ten Rings organization was founded by this guy, Wenwu, played by Toli Lung, and who turns out later on is not only the Mandarin, although not really, he's also the father of Shang-Chi. So he's not just his dad, but he's also a daddy. Don't kink shame me! He's an attractive man, I'm just saying. Yes, he's a good looking guy. He has a good looking family. You know, his good-looking family, and he has also lived for thousands of years because he came across the Ten Rings. Now, in the comics, these were, like, leftover artifacts from this ancient dragon alien civilization of which Fing Fang Foom, big Marvel space dragon, was a member. That was found by this guy, the Mandarin, who used put the rings on his fingers and used them to do all sorts of magical abilities, and yet was seemingly never able to defeat an alcoholic in a flying suit of armor. But in this one, the less rings and more like giant armbands that have like concussive force and all sort of like telekinetic abilities. And they're really cool. And this guy uses them to found this organization and start a whole reign of conquest before slipping into the shadows and manipulating events from behind the scenes. And he appears to be really destructive and quite uh, quite a guy you really don't want to mess with. It also grants him immortality. And he didn't even need the Dragon Balls. Hmm. Yes, and I love how in this film he goes on his own little redemption arc. You know, he's seen Mm -hmm. as this big bad villain that wants to conquer the world. And then we get into where he goes into the uh, Forbidden Village. or He's in the forest, I think, at the time, trying to get (laughs) into the Forbidden Village. Uh, And then he meets his wife there. And they do a little bit of, uh, this makes me think of the second Jumanji film, a dance fighting scene, which I think is one oh. of the, <laughs> which I think is one of the, one of the reasons why the fight scenes in this movie are so good and amongst the best in the MCU. Um, it's so beautifully choreographed. It's more like a dance than a martial arts scene. The way, uh, so he meets this woman there uh, called, what's the fucking name? What's the fucking name? Uh, God, I can't remember her name. I know Shang-Chi's sister. She's Sha Ling, but I can't remember his mother's name. Oh, Ying Li. Ying, Ying Li. Li, okay. Okay, and so, sorry, I do apologize. Oh, God, my imperialistic, colonialist tendencies are showing. Oh, no. Anyway, um, so this happens in the 90s, and he's searching for this village, Talo. And um, I will say there are many references in this movie to various forms of Chinese mythology and folklore. A lot of it is going to fly right over our heads. So if we mispronounce something, if we miss the context of something, I apologize. I'm trying. Anyway, 
Uh, and they have this big old fight, but it turns into more of a dance. And you can see a bit of an attraction going on there. Skip forward a bit of time. A bit of time. And uh, they're married and have a bunch of kids together. Well, that seems really nice. Nothing surely could possibly go wrong here. Fast forward more four years and the kid, Shang chi is grown up calling himself Sean and is now working in San Francisco as a car valet. Valet? Valet? How do you pronounce it? Valet. Valet. They, no, valet. <laughs> Because, like, over here, well, not really over here, but if you watch Downton Abbey, you know, like, a man's personal butler is called a valet, so it's a bit confusing for me. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm not sure if I even got it right either. I'm just yeah. trying to sound very confident in it to make it seem like that I know what I'm doing when I pronounce some of these words. So he's he's working as a valet slash valet with his best friend Katie, played by Aquafina. Now... I watched one trailer for this movie and I wasn't sure how much Aquafina was going to be in it. Spoiler alert, she's in the whole goddamn movie. And when I started to realize that, I thought, oh God, is she going to be annoying? Is she going to be annoying? She's not. She's not annoying. Like, obviously, I haven't seen her in a lot of things where she is annoying, but she's always struck me as that kind of actor that would get really annoying really quickly. And yet she never does. She always manages to be interesting and charismatic and funny. So I don't know why I keep doubting her. I'm sorry, Aquafina. Please forgive me. No, it's okay. I mean, I've seen her in three films, Neighbors 2, which I honestly just wasn't a fan of that film in general. And she wasn't, in my opinion, great in that film. Uh, Crazy Rich Agents, which I thought she was fine in that movie. I don't think she really stood out, but I think she was a, a decent a talent character. In that movie. And, sorry? A lot of talent in that movie. Some of which is in this movie, oh. actually. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then in this film, I think she had she was really good. I think really she carried the movie from a comedic standpoint. Uh, and only a few parts did it feel a little overbearing, but that wasn't her fault. That was the dialogue that she was written. And then when she, the time was to get serious for her character, I thought she did a really good job of doing that. So yeah, I, I enjoyed the character of Katie a lot. I really liked the character arcs of uh, uh, Shang Chi and Katie in terms of being these. 20-something year olds who just don't really know what their path in life is. Um, and then we get I can relate. <laughs> and we get one of the best, you know, quotes in the movie towards the end. If you aim at nothing, you hit nothing. And I thought that oh. was a very powerful moment. And I liked sort of how they eventually tried, you know, found their paths and their purpose throughout the film. And Katie eventually becomes an Avenger. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I think she's made up for this movie, right? She's not... Uh, an established Marvel character that I'm aware of. No, right? I have no idea why she came with Shang Chi at the last, you know, for the last scene of the movie. I just assumed, oh my god, you know, she's an Avenger now. She can shoot an arrow like Hawkeye. Took one day of shooting, and now she is. You know what? If fucking Rick Jones can be an Avenger when he's basically just like the Hulk's buddy, she can be an Avenger. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so they're best friends and honestly their friendship is one of the best things in the movie which is saying something i really like their dynamic i like their charisma i like their you know the back and forth they have uh Simu Liu, when i first saw him i thought okay this guy is gonna be really tough he's gonna be really serious he's gonna be a good fighter maybe he'll be a good actor because i haven't seen other things is this guy gonna be funny he's very funny he's he's good at what he does he's he's very he can be very hard at times and other times very easy going which is perfect for his character I like that he's able to have fun and you see uh, him and Katie going on like a sort of a friendship outing with two of their friends. And one di line dialogue that you really like, they're talking about like the blip and everything and talking about, you know, Sean, Sean's rather past and how he and Katie became friends. And he's talking about like how, yes, yeah, some guys were bullying me because of the reason why we all got bullied. And then we look around and we realize that all the characters there as far as we are, are people of color. And it's like, oh, this movie's referencing, you know, bleakly stating, you know, the hardships some people of color have when it comes to racism. Yes, gold star, because it wasn't wearisome, but nor was it skipped over. They directly acknowledged it, which I love. Yes, and I really liked how this film also kind of went into multiple... Uh, routes when it came to, you know, talking about Asian culture as well as Asian American culture and the differences between that, talking about mm. sort of a wider Asian um, 
diaspora. Is that the word? Diaspora. That's, uh, that's the word I was going to use. Yeah, diaspora. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because this, it's, it's a big difference. Again, I don't have great insight to that. My cultural heritage is firmly rooted in English and Scot- Scottish heritage because part English, part Scottish. So even for me, that can be a little weird sometimes. It's like, ah, oh, where do I belong? England's where it's born, but Scotland's where my heart is. Oh. And um, there's even a bit of a sort of, not really. There's a bit of Asian culture in my heritage because like my mum, uh, I'm an RAF kid. And so was my mum because my grandparents were also in the RAF. And so she lived in multiple different countries, whereas I just grew up around the UK. And one of the countries she grew up in was Singapore. And the first language she ever spoke was Chinese. Now, that was a long time ago. We don't maintain any ties or anything. I don't claim like, oh, I'm part Chinese. No, that's not true. But it would have been interesting to see what her life would have been like if she'd have grown up there. And so you can only imagine what it's like for people of Chinese descent or Asian descent who live in other countries with completely different cultures. And... That's that's always sort of fascinating to me. And you can see the difference because we meet Katie's family. It's a short scene, but honestly, there's a lot said in there about the way her mum's reaction to her and Sean, her grandmothers, her brothers. They're all really cool and interesting characters, even though they're on screen briefly. And I, honestly, I would like to see more of them, to be honest. Yeah, I totally agree. Especially, you know, when the grandmother asks Sean, when are you two getting married and whatnot? And they're angry that she has a degree from Berkeley, I think. And she's yeah. working. Not that, once again, not that working as a valet is bad. It's just they see that they think she has more potential than that with her background and with her, uh, the abilities that she developed uh, throughout college. And she very much is pushing back on that, on that pressure that they're enforcing on her, on that pressure to get married to someone like Sean. Um, I mean, like, we could go out and try and get our lives together or karaoke. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, that leads to the climatic scene at the end where they do karaoke. I, no, let's not even get into that yet. Oh, God. Let's just skip to the end. Jesus. And oh, so sorry. John does not really go into his backstory a whole lot beyond like in his initial meeting, like his parents, his family. Uh, but his past, unfortunately, comes back to haunt him when he's attacked on a bus by agents of the Ten Rings, including Razor Fist. Yes. Take that, Taser Face. We've got an actual badass over here. Guy with a machete for a hand. Yes, and he was in the Rocky movies, uh, Creed, Creed 2. He was. Yes, he, he was uh, Ivan Drago's son, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yep. Uh, he's a Romanian actor. What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Florian. Florian Montenegro? Monten- Another name we're probably mispronouncing, but his first name is Florian. Sorry. Uh, is he Romanian? I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, he's really cool. And honestly, this is both a good thing and a bad thing. I think the fight scene on the bus between Shang and them is probably the best fight scene in the entire movie when it comes down to pure martial artistry. This Why is did they good. go to the trailer then? Yeah, I, I know, I know. But this is the problem. Okay, well, I skipped the trailers, but... This is the problem for me is because it's such a fantastic scene. Simu Lu is like Samo hung levels of. (laughs) But at the same time, I feel like they, forgive me for saying this, blew their load too early. Don't kink shame me. Not that kind of load. It's really, really good. And I I was enthralled the whole time. But for me, the fight scenes never really match that level later on in the movie. They're good. They're good action scenes. But they don't really meet the same level for me. I don't know. What do you think? I somewhat agree with that. I do think the dance fighting scenes, uh, which we get two of them, if I remember correctly, I think those are very unique, and and I I really enjoy those scenes. I like the scene on the uh, scaffolding as well. It, it shows sort of Shang Chi's desperation to save Katie from this chaos and to keep her out of this world. And now he has no choice because she's in the world right now, and he's trying to save her at the last second. Uh, but, and he's going to fail, but then his sister comes to the rescue, so I like that. I, I do think that, you know, the heavily CGI scenes uh, with the fighting towards the end, there's a lot to be desired, but I don't want to get to the end. No. Um, I'm trying to avoid skipping right to the end right now. But I do agree with the Whoa first... Oh, there, I got me a Marlin. The first, scene, the first fight scene is probably the best one. I agree with that. Yeah. 
Which is honestly a bad thing because it is really fucking good. Props off to whoever choreographed that fight scene and props to Sam Liu for doing in like five seconds what Iron Fist couldn't do in two seasons of TV. Like, just saying. Oh, God. And so, and this is starting to build up something because beforehand, at the very beginning of the movie, when he woke up, you know, in present day, he had a postcard presumably from his sister and he's like oh what's going on here and he's like okay katie uh bad news like my dad ran this terrorist organization called 10 rings i've left him and now he probably wants me back so i gotta go to china and save my sister because he's probably gonna go after her because he wants our pendants that our mums gave to her and she's like okay and i thought okay this is where aquafina gets their pint oh no she comes with Yes, it's awesome. He tells her all about his backstory. My name isn't actually Sean, it's Shung. They, you can only imagine the conversation they have about that. That was a funny back and forth. <laughs> oh, God, it's, it, it's really cool. And so they go to Macau to an underground flight club where it's really overground, isn't it? Skyscraper, where they are met by John John, played by Ronnie Chang Chung. The guy uh, from The Daily Show. Yes, yes, I, I love him. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Chang, right? Ronnie yeah. Chang. Ronnie Chang, yeah. Now, he's, he's, you can tell he's having fun because he's got like the dyed hair and stuff. He's having a lot of time. Just like, dude, bus man, I'm such a big fan. And it's this whole like, it's like, it's like this superhero martial arts fight club. And oh, this made me so happy. We see Wong from Doctor Strange fighting the abomination. Yes. We haven't seen this guy. Apparently Tim Roth even supplied his vocals. I guess he had a free afternoon or something. And best of all, the Abomination actually looks like the fucking Abomination now. Because it never really looked like Abomination in the original. But um, apparently he just hops out of his cage somewhere in a shield basement somewhere to occasionally get into fights with Wong. And they got like a cool, like, not friendship, but like a respected, like, fighter... Rivalry or something. And it's like, I thought Wong was giving him advice after the fight, after he sent the, sent him into like another dimension. <laughs> he gave yeah. him advice about like, you know what to do next time because he was getting the best of Wong at the beginning, but then yeah, you know, he broke out some of the Doctor Strange magic, and there's only so much you can do when that happens. Wong is quickly becoming one of my favorite side characters in all of the MCU, just because you never really know what he's up to whenever Doctor Strange isn't looking. Like, I think he's just got one of the characters because it's his own life and his own adventures. Like, he gets into his own set of cosmic horrors from beyond the veil of space and time that he's got to deal with. And then he comes back and Strange's like, where have you been up to? What have you been doing? And he's like, oh, nothing. And we just, we just never find out about the adventures of Wong. I don't know. But... It turns out this whole underground thing is being run by Shang's sister, Zhu Jialing, played by Menga Zhang. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm ch- I, I tried to look up pronunciations. It's hard. I do apologize. Uh, she is a badass. Uh, she's got like a whole bog cut thing going on. She's running this whole criminal organization. And she has to... F- and Shang has to fight her. And she kicks his ass. Oh my God, he's so goddamn cool. Yes, she is. <laughs> oh, she's fucking amazing. And uh, that we find, except they're interrupted by a bunch of Ten Rings people led by Death Dealer. Imagine Queen Amidala if she was a ninja. Death Dealer. Like, he's like a, a, a fucking martial artist juggalo. I don't know how to describe him. He's, he's fucking scary. He kind of reminded me of Taskmaster to a, to a certain extent. Um, just sort of the look mm-hmm. and the fact that, uh, you know, a, a person from Shang-Chi's past, just like Taskmaster is a person from Black Widow's past that was, uh, well, in the case of Black Widow, wronged. Um, but I, I don't know. They never really made Death Dealer as formidable as I thought they could have. Or we're talking about the character with face paint, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm afraid of clowns. Who knows? But he was pretty scary to me. That's fair. That's fair. It just seems like he was... The I just I saw him come on the screen. I was like, Dear God, there's more. No. 
It's like, oh God, what's this guy's deal? To me, he just seemed like the classic character that, you know, was there pushing Shang-Chi from the beginning and, you know, abusing him to a certain extent. But then Shang-Chi yeah. was clearly on another level from him uh, when, you know, he was an adult. And really the only reason why Death Dealer was really holding the fort down when it came to fighting Shang-Chi was because he had backup people as well as weapons on him where Shang-Chi was just fighting with his fists. Yeah, that's a good point. And they do have a big extended fight scene, as said, on the scaffolding with Katie just trying to get out of the way, but him falling. Uh, is Shang's sister just holding her own because in the backstory, like, he was chosen by his father to, you know, fight and train, but she wasn't because ever since their mum died, uh, uh, he couldn't bear to look at her. So she trained herself, like, with this big whippy whip knife thing. I don't know what you call it. Um, I'm not a weeaboo. I don't know the names of Asian swords and things. I'm sorry. I know katana and that's it. Like, what's that? There's a the big staff one. Is that called Gao? I don't know. Anyway, um, nunchucks. But point is, I'm just wondering who taught her how to use that? Because like, yeah, she trained with it for years, but unless you like get the basics and someone shows you that, you're just going to end up stabbing yourself in the face. That's what I do day one. I mean, don't don't you know? If you, the people that watch the most martial arts, like UFC and whatnot, they end up being the most adept at martial arts. So she was observing uh, what Shang Chi was doing, and I guess she was able to learn it even better than him. That is how Sean William Scott learned know. martial arts in the film <laughs> Bulletproof Monk. So it's got to be right. Remember that movie, Jesus. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's better just to observe rather than you know put yourself in harm's way. So maybe she discovered uh, better techniques for herself. Maybe, and maybe. hey, Sean, Sean was not training for that long. I mean, he was training a lot for a long time with his father. But even though we see him doing push-ups in that first scene, who knows how much he was training in between those, you know, for those 10, 10 years when he was in San Francisco. So she was training that whole time by herself, building this uh, empire, her own empire. So, you know, it's somewhat believable that she could beat him in a fight. And she beat his ass in that fight. Oh, yeah. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. So they fight all of the scaffolding. It's really cool. They make, I will admit, they make good use of the environments they're in, as all good martial artist movies do. Uh, it, it's all over the place, and it's really cool, and a lot of stunts. It is set at night, though. Less fan of that, you know. But we'll take what we can get. And they manage to get away. Oh, wait. No, so, sorry, they don't. <laughs> they, they end up... <laughs> They nearly get away, but they end up capturing them and uh, Zhe Ling's pendant and are taken to the Ten Rings compound somewhere. And they're reunited with their dad. And it's like, ooh, what's going to happen here? Because he's been built up as an ultimate badass who suddenly turned cold and hard and was a conqueror of nations. And there's a real sense of fear there. Because even though he established his family, we aren't really clued in as to what happened in between him starting the family and their mum dying. So he's there's a big question mark over this guy, which really makes him seem like an intimidating presence. And that's, again, due to the fact that Tony Lung, in addition to being just an absolute dilf, is quite cuts an impressive figure. I don't care, Dylan. I don't care. He's sexy and you know it. I mean, I, I was more attracted to his character than anything than maybe how he looked, but um, yeah. you know, he, hey, he did have a domineering presence. I, I yeah, understand the, the the Dilf label with the presence that he cut throughout the entire film. And this guy, he, his thing, he does not wear a costume for most of the movie. He's just like in like slacks and a button down shirt, like, and he doesn't need anything because it's fucking Tony Long. He's good at what he does. He was in Hero. Just saying. Anyway, uh, Jet Li movie. Look it up. He and he basically says, "Okay, kids. I'm glad you're here. I know we've had some issues in the past, but don't worry. I'm here for a good reason. You see, you know your dead mum. She ain't dead. I hear her voice calling to me from beyond the Never Spear, and we're all going to be together, be a family again. And then we get the whole backstory about how." Um, they were a family, and he actually gave up his immortality and his whole, like, conquering deal just to be a family and play a little bit of Dance Dance Revolution with his kids. And he seemed to go, and it's like, oh, that's sweet. Oh, nothing bad could happen there. Then a bunch of gangsters come and fucking kill the mum. 
<laughs> it reminded me of uh, Omni Man, Omni Man, and uh, you know the show Invincible being a good dad. It's like, oh, what a yeah. heart, what warming thing for <laughs> you know a genocidal maniac. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Sure, he's killed millions, but you know what? He hugs a lady, so he must be nice. Uh, but then, yeah, then his <laughs> then his wife dies, and he takes his son with him to chase down the gangsters. And fucking kills them all in front of him. That's rough, buddy. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of fucked up. And he's—you can tell that he's just full on grieving at this point because, as far as we know, this is the only family he's had for thousands of years. He had them for like a snap, and then they were taken from him the second he gave up his power. That is really fucking interesting. Honestly, this guy—you could do a whole movie just about him. It's. It's, it's a really fascinating character. And it's like, I've got these pendants because we're going to reveal this giant map using only the best CGI to locate the way to the village where your mum's from, who cast us out, by the way. They wouldn't let us live there. I guess we didn't, they couldn't make rent or something. And we're going to go there and we're going to find your mum because she's hidden behind this massive door and we're going to take her back and we'll be a family again. It'll be great. And in the meantime, you guys go stay in your rooms. I like how Jialing's room is just like full of like posters from when she was a teenager. I'm so proud that her dad let her have that. Yeah, it was very clear that the dad was playing favorites ever since they were young. So the fact that she he allowed her to have posters, maybe it was to distract her from you know, not train him while Shang-Chi was getting, you know, beaten with baboon sticks or whatnot. Yeah, it's it's really weird. And it's Oops. also kind of interesting because... It's interesting because uh, Shang's room in uh, San Francisco, I remember seeing... I can't remember if it was Enter the Dragon or Kung Fu Hustle. Um, there was a poster on his wall of that those two movies. They're two both uh, excellent martial arts movies. Here's the thing, though. Later in the movie, skipping ahead slightly... Uh, there's an actor in there, um, Yuen Hua, who plays a character called Gung Mo, and he was in both of those movies. So it's uh, what sort of meta universe crossing implosion of reality happened here, where an actor from both of those movies comes into a world where those movies exist? Just saying, that's weird. I think I know who you're talking about. Are, are you talking about the character that was also in um, Gardens of the Galaxy? Or no, ah, uh, no, that that no, that's that's Michelle Yeoh. Yes, uh, Michelle Yeoh. Yeah, she's in Guardians of the Galaxy two, I think, and she's yes. in this film as well. And that's not the same character that she's playing. No, uh, she was not in either of those movies. I'm referring to the actor uh, Yuen Hua, who oh. uh, he played. He played this um, like Archer character who talked a bit with Aquafina. Okay, okay. So I am skipping ahead a bit. I do apologize. And but um, we spent a lot of time talking about you know how he founded the Ten Rings, or how his I, the idea of him was stolen by fucking Guy Pierce and Iron Man Three as the Mandarin, like a Chinese dish. He points he points out the blatant racism with that character's name, and I love it. I'm here for it. Yeah, I support that. I mean, they weren't. They didn't call out the racism of Fu Manchu, but you know, they were able to call out the racism of this label of the Mandarin. So that's it's fine. better. They just ignore that. It's better we just let that character fade to history. Honestly, he who must not be named. Yes, <laughs> as opposed to she who must not be named, which is the creator of Harry Potter. La, 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 la. And he basically says, um, "Got to go over there. Going to break the gate." And they say, "Well, what do the people in that village stop you?" And he's like, "Oh, well, then I'll just kill them." Okay, we're not okay with that. In prison, in prison you go. And they're chucked in prison and they meet. Oh my fucking days. I love this. I love this so much because. No, it's fucking Ben Kingsley. I don't. That, that clip wasn't even relevant. So I do apologize. No, it's Ben Kingsley back as Trevor Slattery. He's back. Trevor's back. Yes. He's just, he's full on leaning into the, and a, a sub par, if I'm honest, Liverpudlian accent. I don't care. It's Ben Kingsley trying in a movie. That's always fun. I will say the theater that I was in was very, very happy to see him. And they loved his character throughout the movie. I may have a different opinion, 
of the character, but I will say for the mainstream, love the fact that he was in this movie. What's your problem with the character? I just, I think Aquafina did a good job carrying the movie from a comedic standpoint, and I think it was a little bit overkill with his character. I just didn't think he needed to be, plot-wise, I think he kind of distracted from the seriousness of some of the... Uh, the emotional moments in the film. And I just don't think he needed to be in the movie. I love Ben Kinsley. I love Gandhi. I love Schindler's List. I love Shutter Island. He's in a lot of other films, of course. I just, he could have done a little cameo. I just didn't need him to be in half of the movie, in my opinion. But the movie theater that I was in, trust me, definitely disagreed with me. Jesus, Dylan. I mean, I get where you're coming from. Because um, I think it was very funny at the beginning, but after a certain point in the movie, which we'll get to, um, it's like the movie ran out of things for him to do. So he just sort of faded into the background a little bit. But I mean, as far as the rest of it, you can... Choke on a slice of shut up cake, you unfathomable swamp crab! He is awesome and I would hear none of it! Anyway, we can disagree on some things, it's fine. He's also got with him... Oh god, uh... This thing he calls Morris, it's a little fluffy Chinese creature without a face, which I believe is called a Hundun. And this, is a, this, is, this is the thing that actually, this is a, a thing that's actually in Chinese mythology. So even I, though I didn't recognize it and I thought there was an ungodly abomination that must be burnt at the stake. I'm sure a lot of Chinese audiences, Chinese diaspora, people who are familiar with those folklore would recognize it instantly and probably like, oh, it's so cute, it's a little fluffy Hundun. And it is kind of cute, even though it has no face. But they need him to show them the way to Tao Lo. Yes, exactly. Because uh, he and Trevor apparently have this psychic connection. And... Uh, or something like that. he just understands him it's it's so funny he thinks that he calls it morris uh, which is such a british name i love it there's there's a like a fleet of cars out here called morris miners it's it's very british i'm just saying um and he calls him morris and he wasn't aware that morris was anything more than a fictitious like bit of his imagination like he was going mad and to find out that morris is actually real just like oh hooray i thought you were fake and it's it's very funny they managed to escape from the compound get in razor fist's car which is detailed like a razor fist on the side that's like oh no they stole my car it's very funny and they managed to get their way to talo and it turns out uh there is a way for them to get through using morris's information with trevor translating and they drive rather erratically through the forest, hoping to not get swallowed up by the encroaching like bamboo trees or whatever they are. Yes, and it, it was. I mean, I thought it was pretty cool. They brought the forest to life. The forest became its own little character. And I don't remember who was driving. Maybe it was Katie. Maybe it was Shang Chi. If it was Katie, then another reason why she should be an Avenger. Yeah, she can drive like that. <laughs> and it's Katie. She drives the van. Do we get any of those to drive the van? Are you going to tell the Hulk to drive with his arm like that, all fucked up? No, Katie, get on it. Well, I'm an Avenger! <laughs> well, you know, don't talk about the Hulk right now. We, we don't want to skip to the to the end. end. Uh, blah, blah, yeah. yeah. And so, and they narrowly, narrowly, it's quite a nail-biting scene, actually, managed to get out of the forest. And we will talk about what happens after that, right after these ads. Check them out. And we're back. So they managed to make it to Talo, and they encountered like this big open plain full of Chinese mythological feet characters. Well, characters, um, creatures. Some of which I recognize, some of which I didn't. Like there's the Chinese lion things. I don't know their actual name. There's a bunch of like hundans, some like bird things I didn't quite recognize. Like the Chinese version of unicorns called Kirins, I believe. I only know because they're a character in Dungeons and Dragons, so yeah. Yeah, I I, I would know to be honest. I am not. Uh, I don't know a lot about Chinese mythology, but there were definitely a lot of um, a yeah ancient creatures that definitely had a yeah mythological background that um, I just didn't know about. And it's but it's really cool though because. You could cut them out of the movie and nothing would really be lost. There would still, this would still be a magical place full of interesting characters. But 
they added them in there just cause. And I, I think that's that's great because they don't go into the detail like, oh, what these scenes are. They're just there because, like, if you had a fantasy world full of, like, European unicorns and chimeras and dragons and all this sort of stuff, you wouldn't explain that. So why explain this stuff? And it really just adds another layer of fantasy to this world that makes you go... <laughs> it's really, really cool. And then they finally encounter the village and they're just like... Hey, um, we come in peace? And they're like, do you? Do you really? But then Michelle Yeoh comes around. She's not in space anymore. She's earthbound. And she plays uh, Ying Nan, uh, their mom's sister, their aunt. And she gives the whole backstory of this place. Basically, thousands of years ago, there was this thing called, uh, I believe it's, I don't think they referenced in the movie, but it's called Dweller in Darkness. He's like this big demon thing. He's often fought Doctor Strange. And basically, he eats people's souls with all of his demon buddies. But they were saved by a dragon. And I'm thinking, oh, Fing Fang Foom, Fing Fang Foom. No, it's just a regular Chinese dragon. And, and now I'm realizing this is a movie with Chinese dragons and Aquafina. And I'm worried like, oh no, oh no, Ray of the Last Dragon, Ray of the Last Dragon. No, no, I don't want to have a million conversations about whether or not we can trust different people. God! But thankfully it doesn't happen. They say that the dragon, the great protector, sealed off the dweller in his little corner of hell through this big circular door called the Dark Gate. And Shang and Zhang are just like, wait, our dad thinks our mum's soul is trapped behind that door. And their aunt is just like, oh, yeah, so yes, because you see, Dwell in Darkness wants to be set free. So he like projects people's like long lost loves behind their minds of what they most desire behind the door. So they have an ever present desire to attack it and set free Dwell in Darkness, which would fuck over her humanity, right, good, and proper. And he's got the Ten Rings which means he could stand a chance. And what happens when he lets out Dweller in Darkness? Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Bad times for everyone. So they've all got to prepare for his arrival because they've only, like, pre they got ahead of him by a couple of hours. And there's a big whole, you know, martial arts training sequence. We get a bit more backstory for Shang about how he was set out to by his father to assassinate someone. Did they say in the movie that he actually went through with it? Yes, he went through with it. They never yeah. show like the scene where he ends up killing the person that Which I kinda wish they had. I yeah, me too. I would have liked to have seen sort of his they could have portrayed his grief a little bit more from that uh from that situation. Um but I thought this scene right here where they're, you know, explaining sort of the situation they're in right now and you know, what's behind the, that wall, that wall of uh, God knows what that was. Hmm. The fact that I think up until that scene, we're still unsure what, whether or not their mother's still alive. Yeah. I mean, the Mandarin does such an effective job, um, Wen Wu does such an effective job at conveying to us that she actually might be alive right there and they could be hiding her from him. And, you know, they didn't let him in in the first place. They shut him out. So once again... A villain that thinks he's the hero, and that's not a pun towards Tony Long's past film, Hero. A villain that thinks he's the hero is all no, the more That's the best kind of antagonist, because exactly. in the, they're not even the villain at that point. They're an opposing force against the good guys, but you understand where they're coming from, and it makes him so much more compelling. Especially when you see Shang saying, like, no, I've got to go back to that dark place in my mind if I'm going to stop him, because fate of the world... I'm going to have to pull Luke Skywalker and kill my own dad. Ugh. It's um, it, it's a whole lot of feelings. Aquafina gets annoyingly good at archery after like an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, they told her, if you aim at nothing, you hit nothing. And she's like, well, I'm going to aim at something now. And One Chinese proverb, and I'm fucking Legolas. Yeah. It was a, a day. I think she even said at the last scene of the, in the bar scene, I think she said it took like a day or two for her to master archery. <laughs> and Hawkeye is just off in the background, just like, fucking what? Hawkeye's like, well, you can't make my superpower look like a hold my beer kind of power. You can't, you can't do that to me. Come on. Yeah, I can. 
I'm just like a person. I'm not a shield agent. I'm not an assassin. And I march at Arstry. I know because I fought off an opposing army with it. What have you done lately, Clint? What have you done? Anyway, I'm fucking training Dickinson over here. Leave me alone. Anyway, they're preparing for um, the whole thing coming together. Uh, Ying um, teaches Shang some of the whole Tai Chi inspired uh, martial arts and it's, it's just so cool. Just like the care and attention to detail to this martial artistry. As someone who really likes martial art films, but isn't necessarily a connoisseur, if you will, I really appreciate it. I thought it was really, really cool. Have you watched that many martial arts films? Is that something you care about? or Not a ton. I've seen a, a few Bruce Lee films. Um, the film where Bruce Lee ends up fighting Chuck Norris. I forgot what it was called, but I, I've okay, seen it. Okay, that's Way of the Dragon. Yeah, Way of the Dragon. Yes. Um, but I definitely not in the, you probably know more about martial arts films than I do. Um, I haven't well, seen some, a lot of the Jet Li movies that have become pretty iconic and whatnot. Yeah, I've seen a few of his movies, a few Jackie Chan movies, a few Bruce Lee movies and some other ones. I've uh, been trying to explore like broader wuxia uh, media, which is this whole other martial arts thing. It's like fantasy, but also has some character archetypes and stuff. Uh, which I kind of wanted to see more of than things like, again, Iron Fist, uh, which they definitely explore more here because that's just, Musha is not just martial arts, like straight up punching and kicking. It's also like stunts and, you know, slightly absurd things like fighting people off with like tea towels and your own mind and jump, like it's like sort of crouching tiger, hidden dragon, jumping off of small branches to get to the top most point of a tree. It's that sort of thing. So I appreciate them including elements like that in this movie. And uh, they also get a whole bunch of cool weapons and armor made from dragon scales. Holy shit, that's awesome. Yes, and then- uh, Razor Fist sees that his weapons are pretty useless very quickly once the <laughs> creatures start coming out of the dark or the, the, the wall or whatnot. Whatever the Tony door. Long ends up bashing. <laughs> the big ass door. Yeah, because they... They arrive, they all start fighting, and Tony Long's like, skips over and she's like, I'm going to use my rings to bash open the door. Not before he fucking knocks Shang-Chi about. Yes, he almost drowns him. I mean, I don't know if he knew whether he was going to die or not, but he was definitely willing to kill him in that scene. Yeah, and he just he's just so obsessed with getting his wife back, and then starts pounding on the door, and... A bunch of little demon babies get out. And you think like, oh, how bad could these guys be? Nope, they just fall and eat people's souls, starting with Death Dealer. And everyone on, like, when Wu's side is just like, oh shit. Hey guys, team up? Team up? Work together? Yeah, we good? We good. We, we're good. Okay, let's fight together. <laughs> if they do that, it's a very funny way. I like how... The villain sees the sense of just like, okay, yeah, today's not a good day to guy. Fight together because, you know, demons. Demons are, I think, the great unifier when it comes to humanity. Oh, for sure. I mean, it kind of reminded me of this scene from Family Guy where Peter talks about his idea of doing a bigger Jaws where Jaws oh, yeah. and the people are flying together and they see bigger Jaws and they're like, oh my God, we have to like, you know, this he's a bigger threat. We need to team up together. Oh right my God, now. now we have a common enemy and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have to work together. So that's what it reminds me. This is me back of. when Family Guy was actually watchable. Yes, yes, for sure, absolutely. <laughs> Remember those days, the Halcyon days, the late two thousands, where Family Guy could actually be watched and not have your brain melt out your ears in frustration. The good old uh, days. The good old days. Anyway, Seth MacFarlane's focusing on the Orville. That's fine. Side note: On speaking of the Orville, I've just now started getting into Star Trek Lower Decks, and it's fucking amazing. Yeah, you've no, not even I, seen Lower Decks, have you? No, I have not. I know. You're, I feel like you're, this whole episode, you've been disappointed in the games I haven't been playing and the shows I haven't been watching. Oh, the complete and indescribable anguish. It's just uh, my disappointment is familous and my day is ruined. Anyway. I, I had to watch Lady in the Water last night. I had to do it. It was on TV. I had no choice. <laughs> I know the allure of Paul Giamatti looking around like he doesn't have a clue what's going on is strong, but you gotta fight it, Dylan. You gotta fight. My dad Be lo- strong. My dad loves the show Billions, you know, and I was like, oh, this is the guy from Billions. He's on Lady in the Water. Okay, watch it. One of these things is not like the other. 
Yeah. Anyway, uh, when we were just pounding on the door and Shang is drowning in a lake, but then he sees the dragon below and he rises up on top of the dragon. And this is when the movie full and evolves into a big CGI piss up. <sighs> yeah. At night. I don't have a problem with big CGI fight scenes so long as they're effectively telling a story through the CGI. For example, Thanos on his home planet fighting the Avengers using all of the different Infinity Stones to fight them off, even though they powered down some of the stones, of course. That was awesome. But when it's just some big CGI fight fest and everyone seems invincible and it seems like you're watching a Fast and Furious movie but with dragons... I kind of just turn my brain off sometimes. Not that it was bad. Not that it was bad. Just compared to, as you said, the train scene. I'm um, not the train scene. The bus scene at the beginning of the yeah. movie. It pales in comparison. Yeah, it, 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 it went from being a martial arts superhero movie to very much a superhero movie. Which is fine. I just wanted something a bit different. Though admittedly, we do get a cool scene with Shang fighting his dad and using the Taiji thing similar to how his mum did at the very beginning of the movie, to manipulate the rings and make them work for him now. And they turn, like, golden, and it's really cool. And that moment was spoiled in all the marketing for the movie. It's on every single fucking poster. Yes. Like, I managed to avoid that, so I was fine. But everyone's just, like, going to say, like, oh, that's clearly what's going to happen. You couldn't pick any other visual iconography from the rest of the movie? Jesus. Yeah, I, like, I'm take- fine with this. I find with his outfit with the, like, the dragon scales, because that's actually what his outfit looks like in most modern in comics. But uh, the, the rings, like, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool moment in the movie, and I sort of spoiled it, so it's annoying. Yeah, I'd be taking the subway at like 6 a.m., and I would see a little graphic that would show that scene where they're both tussling, you know, one of them, each of them have five rings. One question about the rings in this film, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, because I love this movie, and I think it's. No, easy- please be Debbie Downer, I like that. I think it's easily a top 15, probably top 10 movie in the MCU. But oh, yeah. the rings, they each are supposed to have a distinctive power, kind of like the Infinity Stones. And, you know, I'm fine with them being bracelets. That's fine. I think they look badass as that. I understand they didn't want it to look like the stones that much. But they didn't really explore that from a, a fight choreography standpoint, the different powers that the rings have. And... Do you think with a guy like Wen Wu who's been in possession of the rings for thousands of years, do you think he'd know how to use them? I understand Shang-Chi not necessarily knowing how to use them uh, outside of, you know, brute, you know, brute force and whatnot. But you think, you know, Wen Wu would be able to use the different elements, especially when he's threatened by Shang-Chi towards the end in that fight scene. Yeah, I my, the only explanation I can think of is that they didn't want to make the rings too OP. They wanted to dive out the power, so... Shang stood a chance, but even then, that might have made his whole like Tai Chi manipulating the rings even more impressive. I don't know, uh, but maybe because they knew that Shang would eventually get the rings himself. But maybe here's what I would have done: maybe to have like two of the rings, or just even just one of the rings, be about like concussive force, and all the other rings get destroyed except for this one that Shang gets, and that's his power from now on. That's how I would have done it. But yeah, instead they just dialed down the powers and made them less unique. But it's still cool. It's yeah. still cool. It's just a bit of a disappointment. And they're fighting and Shang's just like, Dad, Dad, seriously, look, fucking soul-eating demons. Not one of them looks like Mum, unless I'm remembering things very weirdly. And he's just like, oh no, what have I done? And big old fight with them. And he then ends up, sacrificing himself to save Shang. This was the worst idea I've ever had! But he makes up for it by giving his life somewhat unnecessarily. I feel like he might have stand a better chance if they, you know, fought together, but whatever. Shang gets the rings together with the dragon and his sister and all these other great characters. They fight off the demons, stick him back behind the door, glue it together with some super glue, and job is done. Yeah. It, it did hurt. It, it hurt when Tony Long was no longer the central villain to the story. Kind of like... Let me just get this big amorphous demon guy who we learned about in the third act who we don't really care about. Exactly. Kind of like when in The Dark Knight Rises they just kill Bane 
like that, and he's no longer the villain in the movie. So that and did- now it's the person who sang La Vie en Rose instead. That's the same, right? Right? Exactly. I knew they were going for it. Exactly. It did not hit the mark at all. Uh, but yeah, Tony Long, he was enough for this film as a central villain. And maybe they could have ended the film with the monster coming out of the, you know, the, the creature coming out of the cave or, or whatnot. But it does feel like there's a, a decent amount of fluff that they could have cut, especially from the end. But I understand they wanted to follow. That's the thing about this film. When they don't, when it doesn't feel like they're following the Marvel template, that's when the film is at its best. But when it feels like they are and they have to have this giant CGI fight scene at the end, that's where you kind of, I mean, some of the scenes at the end were kind of reminiscent of Black Panther where, you know, you had the giant uh, animated rhinos and you had those giant animated, I don't even know what they were. They looked like Chinese lions. It, like it, it, you see it, lots of statues of them around temples and things. It's a, I don't know if it's like a unique, distinct thing from lions or it's just like the Chinese interpretation of lions. It's hard, like an artistic thing. I don't know. But they're there and they're just like big CGI things. And you're right. That is uh, a thing. I mean, sometimes this movie makes the Marvel template work for it, and other times it doesn't. This is one of the examples where it doesn't. I mean, I'm still satisfied with the ending, but half the problem is it's at night, it's a whole bunch of CGI, and the character that I cared about is now gone, so once they get him out of the way, it's just like, okay, I'm ready for the movie to be over now. And Shang eventually does not kill his dad, they have a sort of reconciliation, they defeat it, and they, you know, have a nice thing with the aunt. We don't know what happened to Trevor. I assumed he now, because he's the thing, he was on drugs previously, but has since gone sober. I would imagine he would have liked to stay there and was invited to stay there and just live a life of peacefulness and maybe put on like Shakespeare for all the villagers. Because that's why he was kept alive for the Ten Rings people, because they liked his interpretation of Hamlet, I guess. Well, he was playing dead, wasn't he? And he may, yeah. he may still be playing dead. Who knows? I wanted that, the him to be like one of the one of the end credits, end credit sequences. We're just like, dude, you can get up now. It's over. Shut up. I'm playing dead. I'm a method actor. <laughs> I don't know. But they end up, uh, Shang and Katie end up going back to San Francisco. They meet their friends who they had the previous conversation with and talked about everything that happened just very obliquely. And they're just like, that really happened. That didn't happen. Uh-oh. Porter behind them. Wong's back. Oh, God. Oh, no, he's hot. And he's just, he's just like, guys, I need your help. I need to talk to you about the Avengers initiative. I, I mean, no, come on, just come on. And he's like, sorry, gotta go. Save the world. And then we get the credits. mid credit scene, however, they speak to Wong, Bruce Banner, and Captain Marvel. What Bruce happened now Banner? Deep- what what Bruce Banner? Well, he's he, no longer Hulkified. Uh, he just was like, oh, yeah, I don't feel like being Professor Hulk anymore. I want to have a, a love life or whatnot because, you know, no one other yes, than Yes, because no people- woman would ever go for a super tall, super jack, smart guy who's articulate and square jawed and fought Thanos. Like, <laughs> there are women out there who do not care that he's green. In fact, for them, that's a plus. Maybe he thought, you know, well, Black Widow was really the, the only girl for me, and she was the only person that liked me in my huge green form. So now I she's dead. I'm saying that she liked him when he wasn't green, but anyway. I uh, liked him both ways. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they, that was a weird love arc that they did in Ultron, and then they kind of just forgot, forgot about it after that. I mean, that could have worked if they devoted more time to it and her motivation for wanting to be with him wasn't that he was a monster and she was a monster because she had a fucking forced hysterectomy. Like, but- I mean, I liked that they were planting seeds of it in Avengers, but it just got kind of weird as the franchise yeah. went on and on and on. And they just it's never... Joss through. Whedon's ever-present hand of, like, maybe he doesn't quite understand some relationships hovered over that. Thank anyway, you. Oh, Josh Whedon did not get his hands on Thanos. That's all I can say because he allegedly had no idea what to do with him. So thank well, God. Fair enough, but <laughs> thank you, Russo brothers. Anyway, yeah, you Russo brothers, exactly. Oh God damn it! Um, so mid credits in the speak with Bruce Banner's camera down on Wong, and it turns out the Ten Rings are emitting a signal to somewhere in space. <gasps> Fing Fang Foom! Oh no, it's end of credit scene. Damn it! Jesus! Stop teasing me! I want my big green dragon, goddammit! Give me Feng Fang Foom! 
Maybe we'll see him in Eternals. Who knows? Uh, in another post credit scene, Xi Ling has become the new leader of the Ten Rings with John John. <laughs> and they're running like this whole campus with a bunch of like new crazy graffiti on it. Um, all of which is mitigated by the fact that the previous credit scene ended with Wong, Shang, and Katie singing Hotel California in karaoke. Yes! Yes! Huzzah! A man of quality! Just seeing Benedict Wong sing Hotel California makes my heart sing. That's what we call closure, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we call closure. We needed that. Because there was a callback to that, because earlier in the movie, Sean mentioned how Katie um, aggressively stood up to those bullies he was facing that were being racist by singing Hotel California at them. It was it was a really, really cool scene. And it was just like a lovely, fun note to end on. And then we get the Ten Rings thing. And that's the movie. Uh, we're going to talk about our final thoughts now. Final thoughts, Dylan. Final thoughts. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's just um, sum up. I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was a very, very good film and easily top 15, probably top 10. I need to uh, reconfigure my top 10 list for MCU movies, but a great start to phase four brings together a very unique character that you have a lot of these characters in the MCU and they all kind of feel like Tony Stark knockouts, uh, not, not, not knockoffs, no offense to Dr. Strange, no offense to, uh, Captain Marvel or whatnot, but Shang Chi seems like a very different character from those. He's kind of um, down to earth, but he's got this darkness to him, and and he's just like he feels like just like this average guy. He's got like this sort of Spider Man quality, but with maybe with a few years of wisdom and a bit more baggage. And I really like that because you ne- you would never see Captain America go to karaoke. I would pay to see that. But we would never get that. You would see Shang Chi doing it, and Wong, and Katie, of course, and I, I think that's cool. He's just a very likable guy, and I think a lot of that is down to the writing of him, but also Simulu's portrayal of him. He's just naturally charismatic, uh, which goes to show. Fucking who was the guy? It wasn't Joe Casado. It was it Kevin Feige who said the idea of having an Asian superhero main character was an experiment, like it's a lovely experiment. And Simulu was just like, motherfucker, we are not an experiment. And I fucking love that. I had no idea he said that. that that's a pretty- I, I don't remember if it was Kevin Feige, but definitely someone high up in Marvel said that. Uh, was it Bob Iger? No, it wasn't Bob Iger. But so, someone said that, and it's just like, dude, we've been making movies for years. Like Hong Kong alone has a whole cinema industry. You don't need... The idea of an Asian superhero is not a new concept. It's fucking not. To call it an experiment is not only ignorant, it's insensitive and insulting. So I, I really respect Simon Lou for calling that out straight away, no hesitation. Marvel, you've got to start treating some of your actors a little bit better because otherwise you'll have a whole host of Scarlett Johansson's. Just yeah, saying. Well, one of the reasons, and you know, I can't confirm this, but one of the reasons why they didn't have a Black Widow film as early as they did was because they wanted to see how a film like Wonder Woman would do at the box office with a, you know, female, central female superhero character, you know, as the lead. And it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> You're better it's, than that. Yeah, and there's, there's this old, crusty Marvel executive way back who said we shouldn't do movies like that because, oh, Electro did bad. Well, yeah, so did fucking Daredevil and Howard the Duck and a whole bunch of male-led, or indeed duck-led, superhero movies. They were bad because they were bad, not because the main character had a pair of tits. Come on. And it's like, come on, this character, Black Widow, she's such a good character. Okay, I want to stop talking about Black Widow. It's a good movie, it just makes me a little upset for it to be sort yeah. of its last movie in the MCU. Um, and going back this to movie... Oh, sorry. But this movie was not disappointing on any level for me. Uh, I mean, a few minor quibbles, but honestly, nitpicks, man. Just nitpicks. It's a damn cool movie. It's, a, it, it's as far as I'm aware, it, it's had a sort of similar reaction to how when Black Panther came out, a lot of kids really like it. It's great. He's great, you know, role model for Asian people. Obviously, that's a broad statement, but it's just, a, it's such a cool character and it's such a cool movie. And I hope, again, first of many we're definitely gonna be seeing more of him later on the 10 rings may pop up later on i think that'll be really cool and i i look forward to seeing more of it and i think a lot of it comes down to 
the um, the screenplay was written by two guys, Andrew Lanham uh, and Dave Callahan, and also, sorry, three guys, and the director, Destin Daniel Cretton, who um, most notably did this film in 2019, Just Mercy, featuring... Uh, Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx, and also Brie Larson. Apparently collaborates with her quite a lot. And that's probably why she was in this movie, thinking about it. Also, I really enjoyed the cinematography, and the cinematographer was Bill Pope, who had done the cinematography for movies such as The Matrix and I think the Spider-Man films as well with Sam Raimi. Yeah, he's a frequent collaborator of Sam Raimi. He did Dark Man, Army of Darkness. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, he did Clueless. I don't oh, know. Why. Oh, that, I don't like the ending to that film. But <laughs> no, that's the, we don't can't lay that at Bill Pope's door. You know that the, the cinematographer doesn't have any, any control of that. But Daniel Destin Creston, I thought was a great, uh, great director for this. I'm glad Asian led film led by Asian director. Looking at you, fucking live action Mulan. Oh boy, I. Have not seen that film, and I do not plan on seeing that anytime soon. Compared to the animated version, definitely not. It's just a plain cash grab on Disney's uh, Disney's you know part just to make these films that are not as good live action, and they're also mostly not even live action. They're all animated, you know, to begin with. Especially in the Lion King, that's basically just you know three you know a more three D three dimensional cartoon. I mean, they never said it was a live action one, but they never stopped people from saying it was live action just because they liked the association. But I, unlike those movies, this movie just comes across as cool and new and original and respectful. It's so goddamn respectful. Again, it's very much the same genre, at the same lane as uh, Black Panther. A lot of comparisons to be made. It's doing really well in the box office. It's got a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. We're a a uh, few people had a lot of people had similar criticisms that we had like it yeah. sticks a bit too close to the marvel formula there's some things that could be tweaked but it, it's the plus is vastly outweigh the negatives it's just a damn fun movie and frankly i needed this after black widow which was just like i want to like you but you won't let me why would you let me like you also and- one similarity to black panther that it has in a difference from black widow terrific main villain that yes. is, in my opinion, one of the best villains easily now. You know, I'm Killmonger. Killmonger. I was like exiled from this culture and I'm like against colonialism. I've got all this sort of backstory in my dad. I miss my dad so much. When it was just like, my, I was a conqueror, but then my wife was killed and I fell back into darkness and I just want us to be a family again. Black Widow, I want to make girls my slaves using pheromones. Yeah. <laughs> But wasn't it, I'm Russian. I thought it was even great that the Mandarin or, or Wenbu was originally like a bland villain. I, he was yeah. like Malekith from Thor 2. I just want to conquer the world and that, and that's it. I know. Well, Mal- Malekith was going to have that backstory. He was going to have like, like, my family was killed by Odin, but they cut that out of the movie. That's why he was such a bland character, mm-hmm. uh, which is and a that, shame. That, because that He was originally that, and then they humanized him in the last, you know, 25 years of his life or so. And it made him all the more compelling having this redemption arc. It humanized him even more. Um, and I think he easily, you know, as we said, stands among the Thanos, the Killmongers, the Lokis, the Mandarins, even if you want to put Vulture in that category. And that's oh, yeah. the MCU. They don't always have compelling villains. Some of them have the They're look. getting better. I think they're really getting better with each movie. A few dips here and there, like we said. Yeah. But they, are, they, they here's the thing. Marvel, when they realize what works, they'll stick to it as much as they can, for better or for worse. And characters like that work, and they realize that now, and they're working on it, and they try hard, and they learn from their mistakes, unlike certain other superhero movie franchises I could reference. DC! Anyway, uh, there's honestly not much more we can talk about. I would argue there's better martial arts movies out there, but honestly, you can't go wrong with a great superhero movie for now. Can't wait for Eternals, though. Let's see how that works out. But on that note, I think we're going to end the show. Thank you very much, Dylan, for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me on the show. This was a lot of fun. 
And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends. Shout from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, like our Black Widow episode. Check it out. It's better than the movie, at least. And if you uh, you can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at podcapes.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come to the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ABTUHYC. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music! Music!